perfect. I got this, fam. on the same thing. Yeah. Well, I was maxing my computer out and I got an i9, 32 gigs of RAM, totally spec'd out. Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome. Today is July 15th, 2020. My name is William Pan. Thanks for joining us in this live stream. If you're catching it live, uh, make sure you say hello and let us know where you're watching from. If you're catching the replay, welcome. And we're very excited to bring this special topic session with you. Um, it was kind of impromptu at the last minute. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world right now. And a lot of times I'll say like, hey, what's going on? What can we do to help our community? And one of the things that I've been seeing a lot of is seeing a long online teaching which is happening i'm dealing with it every day as a parent doing zoom classes with my kids but also a lot of teaching friends who are dealing with having to teach classes online in a variety of formats so uh, today we bring in, brought on a special guest mr matthew black who is the director of percussion at cromwell high school he's taught with groups such as phantom regiment blue knights uh, and cavaliers no percussion and he's also the, also the owner and founder of Matthew Black Media, which provides marching percussion arrangement services and sound design. So without further ado, uh, let me bring in Mr. Matthew Black. Big round of applause. Matt, thanks for coming today, <laughs> man. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. This will be fun. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Uh, the, the good news is Matt is doing most of the work today. I'm just kind of here to, to tag along and learn as we're watching. But uh, the reason I invited Matt today, and Matt, thanks again for accepting the invitation, is Matt has been sharing a lot of the work that he's been doing at Carmel with running online classes and figuring out how do we leverage technology to serve our students, but also keep our teaching experiences authentic and and useful for our students in the current climate. So, um, Matt, we haven't had it. We didn't. We were doing all the pre live stream stuff before we got we started uh, streaming today. So, like, what's going on with you? You look like you have a little sun on the face from marching band camp. <laughs> I've been teaching some box drills, some crabbing, some. <laughs> accent tap some double beat so i got a got a suntan i'm uh, i'm already peeling because i am very english and very european <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good i need to get that base tan i've been inside for too long i'm ready to get outside again yeah yeah we've been trying to get as much outside time in like the evenings and going for walks and you know after just being cooped yeah. up all day just just getting out there when we can absolutely i yes. got that that t-shirt tan Rocking the t-shirt tan. That's that's like the classic badge of a summer summer work that's happening, right? Absolutely. Um, 
So real quick, let me flip this on, which is we do have a handout today. Uh, let me Actually, I should have set this in earlier, but there's a free handout that Matt has graciously provided today for the things that we're talking about. And I know that Matt has some links that he's put in there as well. So yeah. if you're interested in some of those resources, you can click into that. There's a link down in the description below, which I'll drop in just a moment if you don't see it. Um, but you can check out that handout. And Matt, what do you... Uh, where should we get started? I'll just turn it over to you, but I think the main question, I'll try to my best to ask the questions and I'll moderate some of the comments that might be coming in. And just Absolutely. Uh, the question that I think on a lot of teachers' minds is like, what are we doing? Everyone's just kind of figuring it out as we go. You have experienced uh, multiple rounds of online teaching now. And even as of a couple of weeks ago, you finished a, an online session with your kiddos and you said you had some new ideas. So um, yeah. take it away. We're ready to, ready to absorb here. So... We started online rehearsals way back in March, kind of as soon as um, COVID sent us out of meeting in person in school, we kind of just kept our marching band schedule as it was and decided anytime we would have met, we're going to go ahead and meet. We'll do the thing online and we'll do the best that we can with what we have. And those first couple of rehearsals were... Um, We'll call them a learning process <laughs> for me and for them. Um, but it was so eye-opening and so strange. The first thing you experience is you're talking to an, uh, a silent room, essentially. Um, for YouTubers out there, people that have recorded video, it's like talking to the camera in an empty room for the first time. It feels very strange. Um, and whenever you are used to getting their body language and hearing the room react to your comments, all that goes away and you lose that immediately. So strange things like my, my center snare eating Taco Bell because he doesn't know any better because he's been eating Taco Bell in his math class and that was okay. Um, so just setting out some boundaries and some standards and, and the way that I've defined it and you can see it in the handout is classroom management, which that sounds funny because we're in our bedrooms on, on webcams, but what I think classroom management online is um, the first thing they have to do is prepare a usable space. So just using, you know, they have a king size bed and they've got two feet there and two feet there and they don't really have room to set up their instrument in the right spot. It doesn't really work. And so just telling them what the expectations are. I should be able to see your feet. I should be able to see your hands, your pad or your drum should be at the correct height. I should be able to see your mouth so I can see you dudding. I should be able to see where your eyes are. That way I can provide you with feedback in the way I would if I was in person. Um, having the camera facing them straight on so that I can look at how their left hand compares to the right hand and I can um, adjust technique things right away. Um, as I listed here, I have kind of bullet points, but instrument height is incredibly important because that's the first thing to go. You're trying to put your pad on your kitchen table and it's, it's close enough. Go grab a textbook, put it underneath, make sure it's exactly at the right height. Um, duts and sticks out the, just the simple, like we stay set whenever the staff is talking to us, that that's the stuff that goes away and rehearsals get really squirrely immediately marking time. That's something that we lose track of because the camera is on their hands and we forget about the fact that it's like our feet are just as important as our hand. This is marching band. <laughs> you know, we have to keep track of that. Um, and then other things like camera placement, making sure the camera's in a place that we can see all the things we need to diagnose as teachers. Lighting, you know, having a bright window behind them. They don't think of it because they're not concerned about that. But now all I see is a dark silhouette of them instead of them. And just having them put the camera in front of the window so that the window light's shining on them helps you diagnose so much. The thing that will derail your rehearsal first is sound settings. So I, what I did in the first rehearsal was I created a tutorial for my students, teaching them how to go into the settings. We use Zoom as a platform for our video meetings. And there are a couple little settings that you can tweak. Zoom and most of these video softwares think that drumming is just background noise, like it's an air conditioner or something else. And so it immediately sucks that sound out. And so what we have to do is get them to turn all the noise cancellation off so that we can give them feedback on their inner beats. So that's kind of classroom management and the expectation that guys, whatever we do in person, whatever the expectation is when we're all in the same room, we have the same expectation right now. And I'm sorry if you need to use the bathroom. I know you're in your same house, 
but you need to ask a staff member to go leave this rehearsal because you're in rehearsal right now. And it feels weird, but it actually brings a sense of peace and understanding and calm so that everybody's on the same playing field right away. So that's kind of the first thing uh, headed into an online classroom situation to just nip in the bud right away. So question about that. How are you communicating all these things to the students? Do you have like a, a briefing at mm -hmm. the beginning of the rehearsal of the week? Are you sending out a document? Because even something as simple as all that camera setup stuff, yeah, there's a learning curve for everybody. Everyone's starting in a different place. How are Absolutely. you communicating that uh, to your class? Absolutely. So for us, we use something that's called Canvas. That's just an online teaching portal through the school. And the entire marching band has these same standards. And we've created documents that are kind of tutorials that they can follow to get set up. And they've been asked to do that before they get to rehearsal. Um, whenever we get into rehearsal that first time, we do dedicate 15 to 30 minutes of rehearsal. In our first rehearsal that we did, we took 30 minutes and made sure that everybody had gone through the settings. And it was just like back to school night where you're learning to set up your electronic device for the first time and learning how to log into your email. It was the same thing. And so we did that, that first rehearsal. And then the expectation was you should be set up with this at the beginning of rehearsal. We're not going to take time out of rehearsal moving forward to fix your electronic devices. Um, there are lots of other tools you can use that are free, like Slack. That's a team management tool that you can use to talk to all of your um, team or your percussion section outside of rehearsal. Any platform like that that you can communicate with all of them quickly works really, really well. I, for the percussion, use um, a program that is called Basecamp. Um, it's an expensive, expensive piece of uh, online uh, the portal, I guess, is the best way to describe it. But if you're a teacher, it's free. And all you have to do is prove that you're a teacher. And it's Google uses it. Uh, Windows, Microsoft uses it. It's a very, very powerful tool. We use that to share all of our music. There's a calendar on there that you can actually schedule video assignments. And they can post the assignments to that on the calendar. There's ping, so you can chat to an individual really, really quickly. You can upload all different types of files, video, sound, uh, PDFs, and there's no file restrictions in terms of size. So I've gone with Basecamp. The school as a whole uses Canvas. Mm -hmm. So if I can summarize for the audience real quick, number one, communication is going to be really important, having some sort yes. of tool to reach your students and, and get them the information that they need. And then number two, uh, we're talking about taking the time up front to set everyone up uh, with the protocol and the things that they're going to need, the tools, the setup, so that rehearsals can function as normally as possible once we do get up and running. So that upfront time, you should be ready to invest that to make everything else smoother down the line. Absolutely. Great. Um, let me pause for just a moment. Everyone that might be just coming in and joining us, uh, today we're meeting with Matthew Black, Director of Percussion from Cromwell High School. We have some uh, answers and solutions and hopefully some answers to your specific questions about teaching online music. So if you have any questions that you'd like to drop in, uh, please do so in the chat and then we'll take questions uh, throughout. I'll just kind of monitor those, monitor those for you, Matt, and uh, team up as we Absolutely. go. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. great. What's next? Um, so the the first thing we were going to talk about is just what do rehearsals look like at Carmel? Um, and this has been an experimentation thing. So usually at this part in the summer, we take three weeks in preparation for a 4th of July parade and we do 1 to 9 p.m. Um, we establish fundamental marching technique. We establish all of the musical exercises. And then we start to work through Stars and Stripes Forever and a cadence. And that's just a base coat, learn to band a little bit in June um, before we take a nice little break off. Um, and so we knew immediately going one to nine on Zoom meetings every day with no parade performance at the end was um, a little overkill and not necessarily wise. And so what we ended up doing was we decided to just cut that to one to five. And then each evening we assigned a video assignment that was visual and that was music and that was physical training. And so we had them going through some conditioning because they're missing out on a lot of um, physical conditioning that we would have been doing in person. Um, it also gives them kind of the flipped classroom experience where they can kind of move at their own pace and work on things on their own. And it guarantees that they're working individually, not just when they're with us. 
Um, so we're still kind of making up that one to nine, but we're doing it in a way that's not as not quite as monotonous. If someone's not familiar with that flipped classroom term, could you just speak on that for a moment? So I'll, I'll describe it like it's math class. So the, the concept is, and it would have worked really well for me if it had been around because I'm super ADD and I was bad at listening to lectures. But the concept is that the teacher um, might record a lecture or the concepts and then the student will digest that information at home at their own pace. They can fast forward, they can rewind, they can pause, re-listen to instructions, and then they go into the classroom and then they actually work on projects or homework with the teacher there available. And then in person, they're working on their homework assignments, which is so much better because you have my mom and dad who my mom is a wonderful writer and could help with everything in English that I needed. But when it came to math class, she was like, I'm sorry, kid. Uh, read the chapter over again. I don't know what to tell you. Like, um, so it really helps in the band world because we're able to give them pedagogical videos of here's how you set up the fundamental technique on snare drum. And they can fast forward and rewind and look at what the hand's actually supposed to look at again and, and, and move at their own pace. And then whenever they meet with us, they're bouncing questions off of us. They're getting ideas. And they're able to give us feedback on like, I struggled with this, I struggled with this. And the other thing that it does is when we go and we watch their videos, it gives us feedback on, we need to work on this tomorrow. We have an idea of, okay, they're struggling with this. They didn't struggle with this. We can skip that, spend more time on that. Yeah, that makes so much sense because now when you guys get together, less of your time is about relaying the information and it's more about reacting what you saw either in their video or what you're seeing in the moment and and working together as opposed to hey here's information that i could have given you just in a one-way video yeah and i do have to preface my mom was a math teacher so she's watching this that was just a general story i'm sorry mom you're a wonderful <laughs> math teacher and she'll kill me if she's watching this and she's uh, like I'm with math all the way through school that's bogus <laughs> No pressure for to all the parents out there. You know we have two little ones over here. So to all the parents out there who are are helping their kiddos right now with school and yeah. and the other hundred things that are happening outside of school, uh, we totally empathize. We're with you here. So nothing but love for mom and mom and dads out there. Absolutely. Well, so should I dive into this kind of nitty gritty of what's going into the rehearsal? Can I ask something about those three categories? You said you had a visual rehearsal, there's musical, and then there's like the physical strength training. Um, yeah, yeah. If you're someone who doesn't have, like at least we have a framework now, like, okay, here are three things that we could be hitting to help prepare, but I don't have a 15-week physical training curriculum or a 15-week music training. Like, are you guys making it up at the end of each week based off of what happened that week? Are you laying out a master plan before this all goes down? What does that look like in a preparation planning process? So we have a cheat code and our cheat code is Jeff Young and dynamicmarching.com. Um, so our visual head at Carmel High School is a guy named Jeff Young and he has created a wonderful online resource that you can actually access um, at dynamicmarching.com. It's a course, it's $150, um, which can be a lot of money, but for what you get for that $150, um, there's hours of material with Todd Ryan, who teaches Blue Devils at Visual, with Richard Saucedo, who won all, he was the Brass Ranger when you were at Cavaliers, and I can keep going down the list of amazing teachers. Um, you get a lot of bang for your buck out of that program. Um, but there's a lot of that stuff that's available through social media platforms now. Marching Health has a bunch of stuff. Ultimate Drill Book has done a really good job of sharing all that. Marching Health is another online uh, social media presence, really on Instagram, they're big. Um, but if you're just looking for kind of workout routines, there's a lot that's available on YouTube for free. Now, I'm a fat guy, but I work out all the time. My wife's really a health nut. Um, if you look out, if you look at um, body weight workouts on YouTube, what that means is you're using your own body weight to do the workout. Um, there are a lot of programs that are for free bodybuilder.com has a lot of free programs because they really want you to buy their protein powder. They really want you to buy all of their extra programs that are outside of that. 
And their hope is that after you finish the first free program, you'll move on to be a massive bodybuilder or something. So there's a lot of free stuff on bodybuilder.com. So that's kind of a smattering of places you can get stuff. Um, along in terms of the music stuff, Way on Pan, um, Gridbook, uh, marching vlogs. There's a ton of really, really good online resources for marching percussion, more now than ever. All right, man. Matt, those, uh, those affiliate uh, sponsored post checks are going to start rolling in after that. Yeah, yeah. I just, <laughs> I just made a thousand bucks. Let's go. All right. Speaking of which, uh, no we'll plug it at the man, end. But... We're doing this out of the love. <laughs> We we do have a plug at the very end, but uh, Matt does have a Patreon page. So if you're enjoying this type of yeah. content, well, it's linked uh, down below. We'll put it in the description as well. But you know, you can throw a lo- little love to Matt that way as well, and to all the uh, the links that we have uh, to people who are watching, or if any of those brands happen to ca- be catching the stream afterwards, please feel free to drop your links down below. Because I know as educators, so much of what we do is sharing our resources with each other so that we can find the material faster f- to serve our kids. Absolutely great, um, and then. That takes us to, you want to hit number three? Are we moving into, uh, actually, can I ask you about show music? Because there's a lot changing right now. Um, Usually at this point of the season, we have the show, the kids have the music, they're already working on it. How have you guys worked with the kids up to this point, and how are you planning for the unknown moving forward? Absolutely. So one of the best things that we did, and this isn't necessarily available to everybody, but especially for the front ensemble folks, is getting instruments to the students in their houses. So if I'm a marimba player, I can only do floor exercises for so long before it's not really beneficial for me. I mean, or fun. I mean, it's important that we keep this thing fun. That's why we're here, right? Um, So working on show music, I think getting the instruments to them is imperative and for the marching percussion members too especially bass drums their technique is so unique because they fight gravity and so if we can get instruments to their houses and stands or carriers um, other battery instruments too if the guys can get used to starting to wear their drums and start to build that back strength up that helps in terms of the show music that we're actually working through um we have been kind of playing it by ear. We've been writing the show as normal. We're fortunate to have fantastic designers. Richard Saucedo working on the, the wind book. Michael McIntosh working on their percussion. Um, and they've just been writing on our normal schedule. Again, we've been trying to keep our schedule as close to normal as we possibly can. Um, now, I have 14 clients that I'm writing percussion for. And so I've seen... Just 14? A, you should really start trying to apply yourself, Matt. 14 i know i'm shooting for 75 but you know i'm just not that big yet Good God, uh, man. but i i actually counted up the other day because it was interesting i had this nice little sample of my own groups that i was working with and i was seeing how each state was reacting and who was going to push the show to next year and who was going to actually just use this show and push all the way through no matter what happened what i'm seeing as a trend is a lot of folks going non-competitive but still going to any performance opportunities that they can. I'm seeing folks using kind of a best of situation where they'll take movements of past shows that they've done at their school. Uh, Maybe that the seniors have done the opener and then the second movement, and then they're only plugging in one movement. It's still a fluid thing at this point. I don't think anybody knows exactly. If you're watching this a month from now, you're like, this guy's an idiot. We all went home and none of it happened. But um, our hope is that we're going to be able to provide some sort of in-person experience. It's going to be a fantastic experience for all the students. So um, I think it's most important that you're doing what works best for your program. For us personally, we have the first half of the show and the students have learned the first half of the show and our in-person rehearsals have all been about setting them up to work on the show by themselves Mm. and we're still right on track in terms of schedule because usually at this point we just finished the fourth of july parade we're taking three weeks off and then we meet the last week of july and start really digging in on the show music Mm. so you know that's kind of a loaded answer but i think that gets us close so for the teachers out there who number one aren't sure what's going on no one knows what's going on and everyone is kind of just playing it by ear uh, we're keeping yeah. the interests of the student at the forefront in our decision making, what's going to be best for the students. And even though there may or may not be a false show, there's still a lot of individual work that can be done for the student in terms of elevating their personal level of playing 
and we're again, you know, knowing what's best for our students, the teachers can make the decisions on how to approach that with them. And nothing is time wasted. Every single fundamental exercise we do with them is going to pay off at some point soon. Yeah. And it's all valuable. You know, they'll be able to apply these skills to other areas and so it's all time worth spending. Great, great, great. We have a couple comments coming in over here, uh, Matthew. Max Mullenix is coming in saying, yo, what's up? Hey, what's up, Max? Good to see you. Uh, we both know Max differently. I marched with Max uh, at Cavaliers yep. in the early 2000s, and then you met Max yep. later in life uh, at Colts. Yep. Uh, Max dealt with me as the center snare for a couple of years. God help him. <laughs> <laughs> do you have, He's do you got have... all, the, all the dirt on me. <laughs> Do you have a funny uh, Max Molnick story, not too incriminating for either of you, that you can share with everyone at the top of your head? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Man. I don't know. <laughs> too There's... many. Which one do I choose? <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking like school appropriate. I don't have any stories. <laughs> okay, all, right. No. <laughs> all right, moving on. Uh, we got Mr. Arve, Brandon Arve in the room. What's up, Brandon? And then uh, Savager Alex Plays on YouTube says, are we able to take questions? And yes, we are able to take questions. So Absolutely. Uh, if you have any questions coming in, uh, Taliqua Kirk, welcome to the room. Taliqua, sorry if I'm mis mispronouncing that. Uh, coming in from Fort Worth, Texas. Everyone, thank you for coming in and joining in this talk today with uh, Mr. Matthew Black. Um, let's keep it moving, Matt. We're moving on. Um, so we're figuring it out as we go. And then what about if you have a big program versus a small program? You know, what are the things that we can Absolutely. relate to both? But what are the things that maybe that you guys are doing that are working for you? So we're very fortunate to have an expansive staff. You know, we have a huge program. There's 330 to 350 in the band program, depending on the year. Um, and so with that, we have an expansive staff. So I had five or six folks with me just helping with percussion each day online. And so in the Zoom platform, you're able to use these things called breakout rooms. And so what we actually did was break into subsectionals. And that really helped, especially for people like bass drums, um, especially for people like auxiliary rack players and timpani players. Um, you know, when you think about, uh, when I'm arranging for front ensemble, sometimes I'm writing for 14 different voices at the same time. And so they all have their own needs and their own experiences. And if we just lump them into the same place, um, the thing that I've run into the most is that um, it's hard to keep them engaged when they're in their own room and right below the camera <laughs> is a phone. <laughs> Um, I'm not texting over here, by the way. I'm, I'm moderating I've, the comments. I've been so. texting this whole time. <laughs> I just texted Max. Um, uh. So that's the first thing that you can do. So you don't have a staff. You can't do breakout rooms. What I would recommend is instead of having a three or four hour rehearsal, I would do an hour with each section mm -hmm. so that you can give them dedicated time and get them focused. The best tool that I've used in that situation has been the click tracks. So there's no way, I don't care how good your internet is, unless they are literally connected via ethernet in the same building, you cannot get an internet connection fast enough to do bass splits. It's just not gonna happen. <laughs> you can't even get snare drums drumming clean together, marimba's playing together, it doesn't work. Yeah. And so what I have done is I have taken the click tracks and I actually paid to have my inter internet upgraded. Mm -hmm. I switched to fiber, I'm fortunate to have fiber internet and what that's done is I can use the share screen feature inside of Zoom and I can play the click track from my computer and they can play with the click track. That's worked really, really well, especially for the bass drummers. We have an all new bass line at Carmel this year. They're all really, really intelligent. They're gonna be fantastic. But how weird is it to play bass drum for the first time, not being able to hear any of the other bass drums? Hmm. Um, so I've what I've found is that I am spending way more time preparing before the rehearsal. Hmm. And after talking to some master teachers and you know the directors that are at Carmel that have been there for 30 years, they're saying the same things. I have spent more time planning for this rehearsal than we were in rehearsal. Hmm. And so anything that you can do creatively, if you have any ideas, people that are watching, it's it's all been a smattering of ideas that we've all gotten from each other that it just pops into somebody's head when they're in the shower and it's like oh my gosh that changes everything so 
That's a great point. And um, with all of our live streams that we do, if you have a suggestion, or if you want to piggyback on any of the ideas that you're hearing right now, uh, other resources that you use, please drop them in the comments below because what's going to happen is other people are going to catch this video and the replay. Maybe it gets shared out with other uh, friends, and teachers, and students. So uh, please share your ideas. Even though we're not reading every comment or verbalizing them, you can still see those in the comments. So, um, you know, we're just here to help and share the information that we have. Question about the, uh, the bass track. So you have a prepared audio track that you broadcast out in the stream. Yes. And that's just so that the students have something that they can listen to as they're repping a section or running a section, right? Correct. But so, what they're playing um, isn't really influencing the other students. They're all muted yeah. <laughs> at all times. Okay. So one thing that's interesting is when we're in rehearsal, every kid is muted unless we're doing down the lines. Sometimes I'll say, we're all going to play with Sam this rep. Uh -huh. And Sam is our center snare uh, at, at this rehearsal, and he's going to click us off, and we're all going to play with him. But as soon as you have more than one person's microphone unmuted, it just goes into mass chaos, and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and a little bit more about those click tracks. The way that I'm making them, I use a piece of software called Sibelius with virtual drumline, and I'm able to um, solo individual instruments and export MP3s for my students. Mm. And so for all of our exercises, I've exported stems or individual snare track, tenor track, bass track at each tempo. And that took me, you know, a day. Um, but it probably saved us a week of rehearsal that we would have lost just fiddling around trying to figure out what to do. With the show music, I also have access to that. So Mike McIntosh sends me a Sibelius file and I'm able to export the individual stems with the metronome click underneath it so that they can play with it. I also export stems for just the drum line, just the front ensemble, and the full entire package so that you can kind of start to listen ensemble as well and figure out as a bass drummer, okay, my part does line up with the snares there. So that when we get in person, it doesn't feel totally foreign. Mm -hmm. If someone doesn't have a whole lot of experience with uh, using some sort of notation software to export MIDI tracks and things like that, where, where would you yeah. recommend that they start? What's like a, at the baseline, if I was gonna make one, I don't have time to do one for yeah. every section. I'm just gonna do one for my kids. Uh, what yeah. would you do? Would you do like show music with a click track? So what I would do is I would use, um, it depends on what you're um, trying to accomplish. Um, if you have access to the arranger that wrote your music for you, I would just nicely ask them, maybe give them a hundred bucks. And I would say, could you export the stems for me at show mm. tempo? Mm. And if they export them at show tempo, you can plug them into software um, one is Tonal Energy. Tonal Energy is a piece of, uh, it's an app for your phone that is a metronome, it's a tuner, but there's also a feature that if you swipe to the right, there's a folder that pops up and you can actually open MP3s in the software and it allows you to slow the tempo down without changing the pitch. And so student, you, you might only have one click and instead of you having to export at each tempo, the student themselves can just that piece of software is $4 and it's an amazing value. But if that financial restriction prevents you from allowing to request your students to get it, there's tons of free options out there that jazz guys use all the time. Um, in terms of exercises, let's say you don't have Sibelius and Virtual Drumline. Muse score is on iPad and there are a lot of free drumline samples now that are included with that. So you could very quickly pop in accent tap and triplet rolls and bucks and just spend a night doing that and you can export audio tracks from that. Hmm. So that could be a tool that's a free option there as well if you have an iPad. Cool, cool. So lots of technology options and um, and maybe the takeaway from that section was just not that teachers don't have enough stuff to do but more that preparation <laughs> up front uh, is gonna make your life a little bit easier once you actually are in the trenches doing, doing the deeds. Yeah. yeah, what I've found is that I have rehearsals that are being canceled left and right or rescheduled, and any time that I have a rehearsal scheduled, I kind of repurpose that time, and I reverse engineer, and I try and do something that's going to 
help my students learn. And so I'm not really losing any time. I'm just repurposing that time so that they can be more efficient and they have a better time playing with click tracks. If I'm a bass drummer, it is so much more fun to feel like I'm playing with a bass line in my headphones than to just be counting with the metronome. You know, we're old school. All we had was our friend Dr. Beat and that thing was 140 bucks and you took very good care of it. Um, now they have access to so much uh, cool stuff to drum with. I think that helps a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty much limitless at this point who and what they play with. Um, yeah. You know, it's just a few clicks away. It's on demand. Um, Absolutely. I, I was just, who was I talking about this the other day? But with Sibelius and BDL, talking about old schools, like preparing for camps where we get the show music. And, yeah. oh, I know what it is. I saw some student online who didn't know how something sounded, so they inputted the whole thing themselves into MuseScore just to get that playback so they had something to listen yeah. to. And yeah. I remember when I would prepare for camps, I would input the sheet, the PDFs that we had gotten into Sibelius and then practice yeah. along with that. But that was like yeah. cutting edge at the time. Like no one else was doing that. Yeah. And I was like, I feel like no I had this. To... <laughs> I did the same thing. Max Molnix wrote a seven lit. Max Molnix wrote an eighth note seven lit. And I had no idea. You're like, what does that mean? How that was supposed to feel. And I put it in Sibelius and yeah. I figured it out. And then I showed up at camp and he was like, you're thinking too hard. Just fit this many notes between this space. And it was like, all right, cool. <laughs> you're like, well, I got my protractor out and I figured it. <laughs> yeah, I, I measured it. And the square root is actually, I'm correct. <laughs> oh, it's great. Um, uh, before we go on to the next bit, which I think is very, very important, uh, you mentioned briefly using breakout rooms uh, within Zoom. If someone hasn't done yeah. that yet, what does that look like and, and, and how do you use that? Yeah, so I think you need a pro account um, to do this. And for me, I, I look at time as money for me. And so if I, it's $15 a month to get a pro account. And so for me, that's a no brainer because it's gonna save me time to be able to break. Um, if you have staff members, what you can do, a couple little pro tips with staff. Um, you have everybody join the meeting and what you can do is you can assign manually um, who is in what room. So I create a bass drum room and I assign all the bass drums. I create a tenor room, assign all the tenors. And then I assign my staff member into each of those rooms. Um, there's no like automatic way to do it. Um, unfortunately, you have to go in and input them individually. But when you do that, you hit enter rooms and it's just like a business meeting would be where everybody goes to their individual rooms and you can set a time limit. So you can say in 60 minutes, the meeting will end and everybody will return to the main room. Um, so that works really, really well. I've actually used that breakout room for another purpose, which is uh, meet and greet. So we'll do icebreakers. There is an auto assign function. And so I'll just set it to four people per room. I'll give them three icebreaker questions and it's given us an opportunity for the freshmen to intermingle with the upperclassmen, the front ensemble people to meet some of the battery guys and they come back a little rejuvenated. As soon as I start to feel their energy level start to like, you know, the, their eyes start to glaze over. It's like, mm. all right, Three icebreakers, your favorite fast casual restaurant, what's your Chipotle order, what's the last movie you saw? And they get in the room and they come back, they're all laughing and giggling and you know, it's it's great. So mm -hmm. so part of it is fun little tool. Yeah, you're you're reading the room as you're running, which is again it's very difficult because you're you're reading people through a computer screen as opposed to in the yeah. same physical space as you normally would. Um, but also remembering that that social component that we normally get at a summer camp or being together is maybe more important now than, than ever. It's not yeah. always about the instruction. Absolutely. It's also about the, the connection. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's actually well, the perfect segue. I got one other thing. Yeah. I got one other thing with that as I'm looking at these bullet points. Yeah. If you don't have a staff, this is something that I used. I used to work at Marion Catholic and when I was at Marion, um, they're a, a notable BOA school um, and they are not financially hurting by any means but they had some limitations versus some of the other public schools that were able to fundraise specifically for the band when I was at Marion um, it was really hard for us to fundraise for just the band because the school itself had to fundraise to keep the doors open because it was a private school mm -hmm. and so one of the things that I did was I traded time with other staff members in town so I had friends at other schools and I would say 
if you can come in for a two hour rehearsal, I'll come in for you on this two hour rehearsal and then we can split into subs and we can get more done. Yeah, we're not going to get paid, but we're homies and we're teaching drums. Like, come on. And that stuff pays huge dividends. As these rehearsals get canceled, start paying your friends and burritos and trade time with them. Say, hey, we're all remote right now. If you come and teach with me on my Skype call from one to five, I'll teach with you from six to nine and we can get into some subsectionals because we're all remote. Um, another thing that you can use with that is you can bring in anybody you want, anybody. You have access to almost anybody that you want right now for probably 150 bucks. I bet you could get anybody for 150 bucks for an hour. And so start to use that creatively and start to expose your students to some people that they might not have access to uh, right now. So anyways, just that last little bit. Yeah, man, honestly, at this point, because because we're all teaching online and it's coming through the internet, at this at this point, you can beam anybody into anywhere and you have access now to the world as your staff if you can yeah. you know, take a moment to write that email or make a phone call or send an introduction email to someone that knows somebody. I mean, we're all connected. Yeah, yeah. More so now than ever. Absolutely. So um, and everybody wants to everybody that is big that, you know, is just a nerd and loves this and just wants to teach right now. <laughs> we all are just missing teaching. So we're all foaming from the mouth to to help people out. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, maybe on that, keeping the the rehearsals fun and the energy up, uh, you know, yeah. I know that you're very conscious of that. What are some things that you do with those those breakout rooms or other things to keep the keep the vibe up? So I was at a, uh, a party last night with some friends from Brownsburg, which is a, a really good band here in Indianapolis. The director is Chris Catholic. Um, and I was hanging out with the percussion staff, Chris Murphy uh, and with Zach Schlicker. And we were talking about the fact that these Zoom rehearsals feel like they're like 75% cheerleading and 25% actually rehearsing. Yeah. Because it's not... They miss out on all of those in between water breaks where they get to go punch their friend in the arm. They're missing out on the ice cream socials and the movie night after rehearsal. They're missing out on the sleepovers and the stay up until four in the morning playing Smash Bros. Like, and so we are very cognizant of making band fun because it needs to be fun for them to keep wanting to do this. You know, they. The thing that's so hard about this point in the season for anybody, whether you're meeting in person or not, is that I promise it's going to be worth it. I promise it's going to be worth it. You're taking one step for four hours straight. I promise it's going to pay off. And so the thing that I keep telling my students is everything, every rehearsal that we have, you're making an investment in the bank of fun. Down the road, there's going to be some fun that you have, whether it's a performance or a football game or something, and everything that you do right now is gonna pay off down the road. Um, but to add to that, some little things that we've done that have just kind of, we've been screwing around and some stuff works. Cinco de Mayo, we did a dress up day, where it was just like, everybody bring tacos, we're gonna eat tacos the last 15 minutes of rehearsal. If you got a sombrero, sweet, where? <laughs> um, and they loved it, and that was like the most energy they had in rehearsal, and it, they were super engaged, believe it or not, you know? It got a little squirrely at times because everybody was laughing, but dang, man, that's what we were missing. And so uh, spirit dress-up day for a rehearsal works really, really well. Um, an ice cream watch party. <clears throat> so you can sneak in some education, um, get some videos ready to go. What did I show? Um, I showed Cavaliers 2016 front ensemble feature whenever the marimbas were moving around the field. Um, I showed the Blue Devils do the moonwalk. I showed them Panorama uh, in uh, Trinidad. Just, you know, massive steel pan, not even marching percussion, just something that makes them like, dang, I didn't know that thing existed. That is cool. Yeah. I want to go check out more of that. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a little secret, you know, uh, I'm not going to talk about, you know, downloading YouTube videos beforehand. 
here's what's here's what the problem is. When you try and share your screen and show a YouTube video, yeah. your computer's trying to download and upload at the same time and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And normally I'm very against downloading content off YouTube because somebody put a lot of work into that and they deserve the view. But if you're using it for education and you're trying to share a video with your students and it's not gonna work any other way, there's a program that's safe and not gonna have a million pop up. It's called J Downloader 2. Hmm. And it allows you to, outside of some web link that is in Russia that you don't trust, you can just download um, the video straight there and it's on your computer and you can share the video from your computer instead of trying to share it and upload and download at the same time. Little, quick little hack there. Um, the last little thing that people don't think about in these rehearsals is, um, the icebreakers that has been a game changer if you just google icebreakers for zoom meetings or icebreakers for google hangouts there will be a million there that you can just use here and there as a tool to keep them engaged so those are some fun little tricks that's great so keep band fun yeah keep band fun so what, what i'm getting from this too and and this is something that maybe sometimes it's easy to forget because we're like oh man we still have to be teaching the kids we're teaching the kids we're teaching the kids and yeah. it's not always just about skills and learning notes it's all that uh, the the 80 percent of her giving to them over time with just being them in the classroom it's like spending time with yeah. them and and you know hey yeah. here's a book here's a movie here's a song it's all the human yeah. stuff that's that's uh the thing a lot of people are missing right now because maybe we're worrying about something else or we're we're watching too much TV, we're surfing too much on YouTube, whatever. Um, what are the yeah. things that what are the creative activities as teachers that we can create uh, to keep things fun but also provide value in ways beyond technique and notes? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, we're competing with a lot of other stuff right now. We're competing with. Uh, they're playing more video games now than they ever have. Um, they're consuming a lot of content. They're finding new interests. Mm -hmm. They're finding stuff that they didn't know they liked. And so now I'm a painter. I don't, I don't want to do band anymore. I paint now. It's like you do want to do band, and there's time for both. But you do um, want to do band. You, you do want to do band. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're gonna stay in band. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but honestly, that's a real thing. You know, I, I catch myself in a place where I just want to consume. I'm learning all the time, but I would much rather consume information from YouTube learning something than create something myself, mm. which is something that I've had to catch myself and be like, dude, you just need to put out some content. You just need to be creating something because you've been sitting watching tutorials for a month and a half and haven't made anything with those tutorials mm -hmm. you've been using. And they're going through the same thing too. Yeah. yeah. It's like you get the information, but now you got to do something with it. It's the act of doing when you're at, or applying yeah. it. That's when you actually really learn it and, and uh, put it to practice, right? A um, couple comments coming in Absolutely. real quick. Uh, Jeff Huffman says, totally right. Hardest part with the virtual rehearsals is selling it to freshmen to keep them interested and involved. Yes. Great ideas, Matt. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. What's up, Jeff? It's good to it's good to hear from him. He's a good yeah. guy. Uh, Nick does quad drumming. Says, "Hoy, I love you, do, uh, uh, dude, dude." <laughs> Thanks, Nick. <laughs> and then uh, Ridwan says, "How are you going to teach drumming lessons online?" So for some people, this is the first time they've done any teaching online. Like uh, we've kind of skipped yeah. to like step four. You know, like someone uh, for everyone who may be catching Matthew for the first time. Matt is kind of a tech wizard. Uh, if you haven't seen it, we should link your post where you hooked up your your set, the one where you said, I made fire. You know which one I'm yeah. referring to? You, you yeah, sampled yeah, up your yeah, drum set. Yeah. That was so awesome, man. You should do more of those videos, yeah. by the way. I, I want to see. <laughs> I need to. I, I, I know it took you forever to wire it up. about a three-hour process, and then I record the video in seven minutes. It's the three-hour setup that I dread. It's not the drumming, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the person that asked about lessons, you did a really good live stream before this one with, uh, Dre mm -hmm. and you should plug that real quick. Cause I got a lot of really good information from that. Okay. Uh, let me just mention, that's, that's a great point. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, there's another, uh, mutual friend of ours, uh, Dre and I marched together at, at Cavs. Also, um, you met with him at Colts, right? He was and my snare tech snare and tech battery Colt. caption had my last year. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Andres I, you should check him out on Aya Percussion on YouTube. Uh, but Dre has been prolific over the last few months with creating video. Yeah. You know, when this all went down, Dre's the type of guy that 
when he doesn't know how to do something, he doesn't say, look, I don't know how to do it. He's like, okay, well, what do I need to know? And then once he gets those, he just goes, you know, head first down the rabbit hole. So Dre has been filming content nonstop for his students over the past few months. But as of even uh, three to five months ago, Dre didn't know how to shoot video at all. And so yeah. when he was getting up and running, you know, what is it that we can get started with? And it can be very overwhelming for teachers. But essentially, if you have a smartphone of some sort and maybe a computer at home, you have everything that you need to get up and running. So uh, there's a video. Maybe we can drop it in here afterwards or if I can find it in just a moment when we're talking. I'll drop it in the description. But it's the video that we would say, okay, hey, you're a teacher. You're getting started. Here are the things that you might uh, use or, or consider, like framing, lighting, you know, how do you get it from your device and post it somewhere, et cetera. Yeah. 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 Um, one, one more thing, and then let's get back into your setup. Andres, oh, check it out. He's he's in. Andres I says, what up? Hey, what's up, Dre? Clocking in. Um, Taliqua Kirk says, one of the things I did was have a DCI history by generation, era, era and decade. Used it to compare the differences and evolution of the activity. That's a great idea. Very cool. Watching night. Uh, my buddy Joe Roach, who is, is now with Music City, he texted me randomly one night and he said, hey, um, you know, they just showed O2 Cavs in the uh, the broadcast, like, you know, like with members tonight. And they called it like, you know, old school drum, drum, <laughs> drum chord video. I was like, ah, yeah, I guess we are. Uh, I've officially I entered. I take offense to that. <laughs> I was like, okay. Back I, off, man. Yeah, I guess that is old school now. Uh, DCI history lessons. All right. Um, oh, so back to Ridwan's qu uh, question. So how are you going to teach drumming yeah. lessons online? Um if you don't have Zoom, you don't have any. You got a phone, and you've got a class of kids, and you're supposed to do something with them. Uh, where would you start if you didn't have all the technology chops that you do? I think the the most important thing is having an internet connection that is fast enough that you can adjudicate what your student is actually doing and critique what they're doing in terms of playing. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest issues that we have run into is one of the kids technology is slow enough that there's no semblance of what's going on in terms of playing. If that's the situation that you're in, then and there's no way to, to remedy that, then you're in a situation where they need to shoot video beforehand with you. Um, you give them a, an assignment that is a video that they're gonna play this video assignment, and then you get on the phone with them, and then you, you watch it together. All right, let's hit play. And then you give them feedback on individual things so that they're not trying to live stream in the moment. Streaming video takes very powerful internet. So if you're in a rural area or you live in the mountains or something, um, Eric Shriver uh, is a very, very, very fantastic percussion teacher. And he does that with a lot of students where he'll do the live lesson thing, but some students don't have fast enough internet. So they'll record each of the exercises and then he'll go through it and critique and talk to the students one-on-one -on -one going through watching the video and you can comment there's some I don't use them but there are pieces of software out there that allow you to annotate videos with times so as you're watching and you're commenting for them you could say at 158 watch your left hand mm -hmm. at 352 listen to the space of your right hand double, it's more closed than your left hand double, do you hear that? Mm -hmm. And you can use timestamps to really help out with that stuff too. If you just have an iPhone and you do have a connection that's fast enough, um, believe it or not, after all my testing, Facebook Messenger has the best connection of any of the video software, better than Zoom. So if you can get them connected through Facebook Messenger, um, they don't have to have a Facebook to use Facebook Messenger now. That's a new thing as they started to release this Facebook meeting thing. So you can get them on any Android, any iPhone, and your connection should be most stable using Facebook Messenger. Hmm. That's a good tip. I haven't, uh, I haven't experimented with that one at all uh, yet. And with that timestamp um, bit on the video, uh, I think you can do that with YouTube even. In, in YouTube, all those times yeah. that you, you type in, as if, if a student were to, say, upload a, a video and set it to unlisted if they don't want other people to be able to see it, uh, they don't want to set it to private because private means that only they'll be able to open it. They mark it as unlisted. Yeah. And then as a teacher, you can go in and then uh, annotate those timestamps. And there's two things I love about that um, asynchronous teaching style. One is the student can see those comments 
and the teacher can highlight what they should be hearing, seeing, or maybe feeling. And that's the one thing that I usually share with teachers is, is you forget, like when you see someone play, of course you hear, you know, that crushed it or that early left hand, uh, or you see that their heights, heights aren't, aren't uh, the same. But as a teacher, it's your job to narrate what is it that you're seeing and noticing and starting to bring your attention or your student's attention to the things that you're paying attention to. That's the first thing. Yeah. And then the second thing is, you know, just the act of the student recording themselves and uploading yes. it, that's just going to make it better, you know? Um, yeah. And then you, I, I think maybe it's worth mentioning that you have to tell them like, hey, I want to see your best performance. So don't just do it and then send upload whatever you do, like your first take. Like, I yeah. want you to do it and then you feel good about that take and then you send that to me so that we can watch it together. Yeah. And then there's that self, that, um, that reflection time together. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it actually works better to record a video and comment it because um, when you're in a private lesson setting, even in person, mm -hmm. and the student plays something, I'm guilty of this when I'm playing drum set, I'll rush the snot out of a fill and it's like, I'm not playing that fill again. Uh, and in the moment, you didn't feel it rush. Yeah. You know, um, the student, whenever you're given a lesson in person, you could say to them, did you hear um, where you squeezed the stick on that beat three, three measures ago? And they're like, uh, yeah, maybe they yeah, did. Yeah, they're like, maybe yeah, they're I heard saying, it. You're yeah, like, I did. <laughs> but if you play a video back, there's no question about it. And they can hear it. It's like, I didn't know I was doing that. I didn't even hear that whenever I was playing it in person. It's because... I've explained this to my students. When you're playing and you're listening, your brain is split in three different directions. It's using muscle memory. It's using kinesthetics. It's using the myelin with the nerves. When you're just listening to a video, you can dedicate all the brain power just to listening. And you're, being, you're able to, as the player then, critique at a much higher level. Mm -hmm. And again, just getting your students recording themselves is the most valuable thing especially now that everybody has a video camera accessible to them in their pocket. Holy cow. Yeah. Um, and just another tool with that. It, um, I do a lot of slow-mo video with my students mm -hmm. where I'll use a program that's called Coach's Eye. And you can slow down students' techniques so that they can see things in detail. Um, that's another tool your students can use as well so they can slow down their technique and see what's really going on with my doubles. Am I too open? Am I too closed? Um, really, really cool tools out there. So, yeah. Have you done anything with filming um, lessons for your students? Like, uh, I know you you'll put um, a few micro pieces of content on your social media channel, but yeah. let's say uh, you know that there's a rehearsal coming up that you're going to be covering the the new double beat exercise for 2020, and yeah. you've written the tune, you've got the sheet music for you, and you're like, hey, now I'm going to teach a lesson to myself. Here's the 15 minute lesson of me explaining and breaking the A2 down bar by bar or, or phrase by phrase. So I typically do that for concert stuff. I'll do that for all of the uh, all state pieces and I'll break things down kind of bar by bar what I'm thinking. Um, I haven't done it so much um, for the marching percussion stuff. I need to. Uh, that's one of those things that's like, I got to do that. I got to make that thing happen. And it's been in my mind that would be a very valuable use of your time that would pay huge dividends absolutely because mm. again it's that reverse classroom model where they can go back and if something doesn't make sense to them um, rather than them having to do a private lesson with you where you maybe spend 30 minutes working on one bar and it costs them 25 bucks or whatever they could have just sat with the video that you created and knocked it out and they make progress so much faster mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, ad admittedly, when I started making videos for, you know, my students, that's what ultimately led me to posting videos online, was I was making them for, you know, this private lesson student. I was like, well, I already got the video. I'm just going to share it with the whole class. And rather than having yeah. to email the link, I'm just going to stick it up there. And, you know, of course, you have that initial hump of like, oh, the world is going to be able to see this. Uh, but once yeah. you get over that, the, the access yeah. that you're able to give kids, like you can say like, hey, um, this is how you play flam and they're like wait what, what, what and you're like hey just try to remember what i said but here's a video on how to play flam yeah. just reference the how to play flam video and you know yeah. i i shot my how to play flam video i don't even know how many years ago now but i still that's the one that i use when <laughs> when it when a kid yeah. is raising both up and the grace note is popping with their their primary note yeah um, absolutely uh, just real, drop it yeah exactly straight down uh real quick matt uh andreas says uh 
Matt was the best center snare I ever taught with a head tilt. No way. Lol. <laughs> no, there was one time when Dre uh, asked us to work on a lick. I'm, I'm calling Dre out right now. Hot take. <laughs> oh, watch uh, out. There was one night where we were rehearsing, er, and he asked us to hit a lick on the rim. And I had spent the entire night before on the bus working on that lick, and it was not happening. And he asked us to like hit it on the rim, and I was like, I don't even remember what I said, but I basically, I didn't question him, but I was like, can we hit this instead? And that, I was like mortified as a center snare. I was like, I questioned my caption head. What did I just do? I'm such an idiot. <laughs> and so I like apologized profusely the next day. I was like, I way overstepped. I shouldn't have done that. Dre was wonderful. Dre, I, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that I still do today, I got from Dre. I'm sorry for that moment, Dre. I was a dumb, dumb 19 year old, and I didn't know any better. I take it back. It, you know, it's funny. Is he just brought that story up to me last week? He was like lamenting about when you did that that one time. I'm sure. I'm sure he still thinks about nah, it every day. I'm just teasing here now. But he does say uh, he does share a little bit of, of teaching wisdom here. Dre says at SFA we were having the kids submit videos on a Google Drive. Setting up Zooms yeah. with tech and section leaders and students, and then sharing the screen with their video. Give it a listen and make comments. Record the Zoom, have them take notes, and then upload it to the drive so they can always reference. So there's a lot of uh, of ping ponging back and forth between the content, uh, you know. Yeah. And and you know we were talking the other day. Um, Eric Caraway from Percuss I know we're talking, we're just saying, yep. you know, that creative process or that feedback loop that you can create with that ping pong effect. It's like, hey, here's a thing, yeah. and then here's a thing, and I'll send it back to you, send it back to me. There's a lot of work that happens in that, and and even though it's not ideal, sometimes that that ability to do it at different times of the day, it's like you do something at night and you wake up and the thing is there the next morning. There's actually advantages yeah. to it as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Trace's Google Drive video That's, has a slow-mo option. Oh, very cool. Yeah. That is one thing that we do as well. So Basecamp, the, the, the web portal that we use, when we share video assignments, all the students can view each other's video assignments. And sometimes we'll have them give feedback to one another. And it, it instills a sense of, I need to play this really well because my peers are going to watch it. Yep. That's another valuable tool. That's a real thing too, you know? the the. Oh, yeah. The, <laughs> The hey, you're on the spot. Let's go make it happen. Let's and everyone yeah. kind of like puffs up a little bit, and you say, "Hey, you know how you Absolutely. just puffed up? You should have been like that all the time." <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm uh, watching you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you can rest that you can be peace of mind. Matt Dre says, "I don't even recall. He doesn't remember that uh, that happening." So <laughs> you're off the. And then he he says, "Shut up, way." <laughs> So that didn't really happen. You don't have to be mortified. So um, speaking about that down the line thing, uh, you have a bullet point here about yeah. rehearsal techniques. Um, we are yeah. coming up on just over the hour mark. So real quick to everyone who's still yeah. watching or has been catching the replay, uh, thank you again for checking this out. This has been really fun and informative for me as well. Uh, but I hope you find this helpful and useful. If you like it, please take a moment to like the video and share it out with your other teaching friends because it's just going to help more people see the content and hopefully help more teachers help their students. So, um, Matt, your rehearsal techniques. Um, so the, the biggest thing that you'll find is that their attention spans are shorter right now. Um, and I don't know if that's because we're in our bedrooms on Zoom or if it's because they're distracted right now and they have a lot of other things competing for their attention. But raw, rapid concept coverage means um, planning for seven hours of rehearsal when you have a four hour rehearsal and being able to shift and maybe we didn't get through that entire concept we'll come back to it at the end of rehearsal i picked this up whenever our student teaching middle schoolers because they will be all over the place and you'll lose them and you'll feel yourself lose them as a teacher and so you move on to the next piece and then you come back to that problem you were having at the end of rehearsal and then they're fresh again and then you can get the rest of the way through that so that's been a really really helpful mm. tool um the next is down the lines feedback mm -hmm. loop. So what I'll do is I'll have one student play the part and then I'll have another student critique. And what we're really trying to do here is teach them orally. We're trying to get them to learn to hear rhythms, balance, dynamics. Um, and so them giving feedback to one another is really, really helpful. And our rule is you give them a compliment first and a critique second. And so everybody gets something that they see that they're doing correct and something that they can continue to improve upon. And it's never a situation where it's like, 
you're bad at that. It's always a situation where you can improve on this thing. Um, that helps a lot. Um, the last is the guided practice sessions. And this works really, really well with the show music. So what I'll do is we'll be in our breakout rooms and we'll do 15 minutes of practice where I'll say, take these two measures. You have 15 minutes to work on your own. And I'll unmute each individual and I'll ask them, hey, play that for me. Do you have any questions about that part? And then I'll jump to the next person, next person, next person. And they've all got it muted on their end so they don't hear this going mm. on. And then after that 15 minutes is up, we do five minutes where each person plays down the line and they give feedback to one another. And then we move on to the next chunk and then the next chunk. And so in a two hour rehearsal, it's a really good way to watch them practice on their own and you can see feedback that they need. And this is amazing because we don't get to watch them practice in right. school. Not right. really. Maybe you're sitting in your office and you hear some guys padding outside, but this is real. Like this is really watch them practice their show music and it puts pressure on them because they know in 15 minutes I got to play this in front of my friends. And so I need to learn this right now. And what I found was the next day they've learned the rest of the movement because they're afraid they're going to get put on the spot. And so it kind of it kind of embeds some motivation to learn their parts because they don't want to be the guy that can't play the lick. So that's another really, really good tool as well. Those are just a few rehearsal techniques we've been using. That's great. I love that because so much of the time it is about um, the technique, how we're moving, um, the mechanics of things. And we yeah. forget that when, when you're saying like, we don't get to watch them practice. And I yeah. am still regularly surprised that when you give someone to a kid, you know, as teachers, we're like, yeah, you do this, you do this. You do this. First, you start with the first beat, you work that out and then you tack it on and you loop that. And then you, you, but kids don't see that what they inevitably, inevitably do is just hack their way through the whole part and then make it to the end. They're like, yeah. Okay, I'll start over now. And they hack the <laughs> and they just do yeah. that over and over again. Yeah. Uh, so giving them that guided practice. And then I love how that immediate deadline of, hey, in 15 minutes, we're coming back, that puts the pressure on them. So yeah. that's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And we're doing a lot of micro right now, just learning the process of learning music like you're talking about. I can't tell you how many times in these rehearsals I've said, how do you eat a 32 ounce steak? <laughs> One bite slowly. Um, and that's the one that we keep coming back to every time is when I'm giving them these 15 minutes to get through, it's not something they can't accomplish. It's always two measures and I see what they struggled with. And then that gives me the opportunity to give them feedback. Here's how you're going to practice tonight. This is what you're going to work on whenever you leave me. Here's how you're going to work that out. That's great. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a question here about, um, Putting the kids on the spot. Uh, coming in from Calvin, let me just throw it up on the screen here and I'll, I'll read it. Um, do you ever have students complain about video assignments because they're afraid slash embarrassed to play in front of their peers? If so, um, how would you guide slash help them through that fear? So the nature of what we do is competitive and it's for an audience. And so one of the things that I talk to them is that one of the skill sets we have to build is the ability to perform in front of other people. And that's a really hard thing to emulate. One of the best ways that we can emulate it is having them watch each other. And when we rehearse in person, everybody sees the other people around them. And so if you frame it to them, maybe you have an individual that you know is sensitive, and I have those too. I'm really careful with who I ask to play in what order. So whenever I'm in rehearsal and I'm asking a difficult lick, I'm gonna ask my center snare first that I know can play it. And one of the things that I do is I have the guys play on the rim. When we're doing down the lines, I'll have the person that I wanna hear play on the drum. I'll have everybody else play on the rim so that they're getting a couple extra reps in and they're able to hear the center snares rhythms and balances. And then by the time that I get to them, they've probably worked their kinks out. And if they haven't, I'm super supportive of them. I just have lots of positive reinforcement and I make them feel really good in the moment. It's like, man, you've come so far. And I will remind them, it's like, he didn't struggle with that and you did. You know what? He's played snare drum for three years and you've played snare drum for a month. So don't get down on yourself. Here's what you're gonna do tonight. And you should know, three years ago, that guy was in the same spot that you are right now. You're gonna have to work harder than him this season because he worked that hard three years ago. And so whatever you can do to just keep, we're their biggest fan, always. We are always their biggest fan. And one thing that I stand by is that no student is lazy. 
Are students lazy? Absolutely. But if you run a rehearsal with the mentality that no student is lazy, they'll work their butts off for you. And so that's kind of the way that I frame that. In terms of video specific, if you frame that to them and say, listen guys, there's no way for us to practice performing for an audience right now other than this. And no one is going to critique you or make fun of you. And if they are, I'll step on their neck. You let me know if somebody makes fun of you and I will squash it immediately. And I think it's really important that you frame to the entire group we're all here to support one another. And here's the thing, one core, one score, everybody's drum score is based off of the collection of the whole sum. So if you dog on your friend over there, it's gonna only hurt you down the road. And they're teenagers, and so you have to teach them this stuff. They don't just know that instinctively. Mm -hmm. They're gonna see the guy that can't play the thing, and maybe they're gonna rag on him. Um, you have to make sure that you're framing a positive atmosphere and a positive learning situation to begin with, um, you know, handle those things as they come. I think that's an individual situation that if you can just be a supportive team, hopefully will work themselves out. Mm. So modeling that positive, uh, behavior of support yeah. for your students and you, you know, you're building culture yeah. with your kids by demonstrating what you think yeah. it should be. Um, I might also add for yeah. Calvin that it depends, uh, Matthew made a great point about, you know, he's, choosing what to ask the students to do based off what he knows about their ability level or experience level. So you're, you're, it's like you're setting your kids up for success by tailoring what you're asking them to do in front of everybody. And so if you have a freshman that's coming in, maybe you're not asking them to run it from, you know, the top to the bottom. You're just saying, Hey, can you just play that first bar at letter a, okay, good. Now add on the next bar. Okay. See how you're rushing at the end of the next bar. So when you play that next time, and then you just give them that one little thing that they can digest and then you move right on. Or even if they blow up, you say, hey, don't worry about it. Just keep working that tonight and you move on. And if you don't yeah. make a big deal about it, you know, internally they're probably yeah. freaking out. But they'll yeah. get through it and they'll be like, oh, I didn't die. That wasn't that bad. And then you just do a little yeah. bit and then, you know, th that's where the magic happens. Over the next two, three, four years, that's when they become the center snare. Yeah. And then they can take more pressure by gradually adding it on over time. And I'll add one other thing to that, especially as we were going through auditions and we had new freshmen coming in that had never played before. Uh, you don't have to ask every kid to play everything. Mm. So the more difficult exercises, we're doing Michis right now, which if you don't know what Michis are, it's this gritting exercise that's pretty advanced. And I had my vets only play that. I asked a couple of vets to play it. And then whenever we got to some of the triplet timing stuff that I knew the freshmen could play, I asked them in those moments. So the advanced exercises, I only asked the kids I knew could play it, and then I gave them some feedback so that they were feeling like they were getting something to take away from the rehearsal. And then in the moments where I knew that the freshmen were comfortable, I helped empower them early on. The first couple of times that they had to play by themselves, I made sure that they were comfortable and that they were gonna play it um, successfully. Nice, I'm just, uh fixing my video over here don't mind me uh, I had to cut to a I did, um, let's see um, tips for front ensemble we're, we're kind of moving into the Q&A Q and portion, portion here um, Dre's asking about any tips for front ensemble you know and, and Dre's in the fortunate situation uh, even though there are challenges for every situation uh, he says how do you deal with kids that only have that three octave sixth grade practice marimba so i mean they've got a board which is amazing some some people don't even have that they literally have a board that they've thrown a towel over and they're doing floor work maybe we can start with the kid who doesn't have a board the kid who's got the three octave board and then the kid who's lucky enough to take their marimba home Try your ear into some of this. 
it's not great. It's the best solution, but it's something. It's something to give them you. Let's move back to about, um, I would kill in the mallets while on the board, and then I do a floor exercise. So a quick search, front level floor exercises, practice permutations, which are instance of form to be one, three, two, four, and that sort of the metronome. Deep, deep, one, three, two, four, one, three, two, four, one. While you're sitting down on the floor, that's a really good tool that you use on a floor exercises uh, with our guys. Um, last one is the most ideal option, which is recruit bands. That is of your show. So you got a band dad that usually takes the front ensemble equipment to the shows. You recruit him for a day and you are. you? Yeah, I'm sorry, man. The, uh, the audio is cutting out. Let's see. Good. I can hear you. You can hear me. I can hear you. I don't think the sound's coming out for one second. Let me see what is happening. <laughs> Thanks, man. Let me know if the sound comes back. Check Dre, one, Dre, two, one, Dre two. Just call. I can hear you. It's just not broadcasting. Gotcha. Um, let me see. I don't know how to fix this because I don't see the problem. It shows that it's showing up in the meters over here. This is on. This is on. Skype. Can you say something real quick, Matt? Yeah, that's weird. I can hear you, but it's not coming through. Let me do this. It's not going to be ideal, but I'm going to broadcast you through the speakers. This might also blow up the stream. So, if this is the end of the stream, let me thank everyone for watching real quick. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn a knob on my interface, and this has been known to blow uh, everything up. So let's give it a shot. Go nuclear. Okay. All right. So I can hear you coming through the speakers now. Um, yeah. And it's probably not going to be ideal audio quality, but I think it's reaching the point in the stream where. The uh, yeah. the internet. This Close. is the, that time of the night where everyone starts logging on. The internet in the area starts freaking out. So, um, okay. yeah. Okay. So your your suggestion is to make a board of some sort that they can use uh, yes. at home. That's the main main deal. So the first one is you're gonna. I'm gonna take these out because now it's weird for me. <laughs> oh, sorry. Because you can hear an echo. For yourself. I'm good. I'm just going to turn the volume off. Yeah. So the first option is to Google cardboard marimba. Uh, and what you'll find is you snip the marimba, or you, you snip the cardboard, lay it out, and you get duct tape. And tape is roughly a bit of a bar. And so you lay it on cardboard to make them approximately the length of a marimba. You give yourself two or three octaves, and then that's something that they can put on top of a towel, on top of a table, and now you kind of got to practice marimba. At least they can start to work on the spatial awareness. You can't hear the pitches, so you don't get the pitch feedback, so it's not quite the same thing, but it's close. Uh, the second option that we talked about was maybe they only have a three octave at home. If they only have a three octave at home, I would go into two mallet mode, and I'd be hitting all my green scales and my legatos with two mallets and just starting to work on that accuracy. And then I would save the floor mallet stuff for the floor. And I would do floor exercises. If you don't know what floor exercises are, a quick Google search of front ensemble floor exercises will turn out probably a bunch of free exercises for you. That's essentially just working on um, the motion mechanics and grip while sitting on the floor playing to the outsides of your body. That's a really, really good tool that I use even whenever we do have marimbas sitting next to us. I always start my guys on the floor so they're not worried about pitches. Um, so that's a tool that you could use. Um, if you have the best ideal situation, this is kind of like option number three, what I would try and do is recruit a band dad for a free pizza or something that is used to driving the truck to the competitions. If you can recruit one of those dads to drop off marimbas, so he'll help you load the truck because he knows how to do it, and you just go house to house to house, and you drop off a marimba in their garage. You know, if you have an Acoustalon uh, Yamaha, that stuff can handle being in the garage and that sort of temperature, that sort of thing. Drop off the instrument at their house. It's an opportunity for you to make a personal connection with the student in the mask and actually see them in person and have a laugh with them get to you know, wave to their parents, make a human connection with them while giving them an instrument that they get to play in their house. At Carmel, we dropped off every instrument to every kid in the band, all 330 kids. Wow. Baritones, wow. trumpets, 
everything got dropped off. And really what it was about was us connecting with each of the kids and making sure that they were doing okay. Wow. So that would be my advice for all three of those options. Wow. That's for our Matt. And we've just kind of scratched the surface at it. Uh, but I do want to say thank you for taking the time to share what you've been working on and kind of picked up over the last couple of weeks with us. Uh, maybe we can do another one of these uh, further down the road. Um, I will take a moment to say that kind of one of my takeaways from today's uh, session is hearing you talk about the different ways that you have been connecting with your students, right? Uh, helping them connect with each other, the teachers are connecting with them, teachers are connecting with each other, even though we are in this social distancing atmosphere. Um, maybe physical distancing is more appropriate of a term, and uh, you know the things that we can do to still stay socially connected with, with each other, um, we should help facilitate that as much as we can. Well, I really appreciate you having me on. You know, I think back to a few years ago, seeing you get started and just really admiring everything that you've been doing, the education that you're providing. A bunch of students, whenever I was a kid, before I went to Carmel, I didn't move to Carmel until I was a sophomore in high school. And before that, I went to a school, Northwestern. It was about 45 minutes north, and I had a, a great teacher, but I didn't have access to the newest, freshest technique and rudiments and I actually used VicFirth.com's rudiments where they had the slow, fast, slow, and I played with the stuff that was available at the time. And you're providing a service to students that we see now at Drum Corps. I do drum corps camps, and you'll have kids that come out of nowhere that you look at their drum lines like, your drum line sucked, kid. Like, <laughs> your drum, you came out of nowhere, and there's something to that. There are kids that make it into drum corps that had a little bit of, I had to figure it out on my own. And we know those guys. We know those guys that we grew up, grew up with that there's a guy that came out of nowhere that is just a monster snare drummer, a monster tenor drummer, that the reason they're there is because they had to figure it out on their own. And I think that you're providing a wonderful service to those students that don't have access to wonderful staff, um, which we are for, fortunate to, uh, to have, so. Well, thanks very much for those nice words. Um, and um, you know we're we're one of those examples where we met online, even though we have mutual friends uh, at different periods of our lives. It's uh, it's us like connecting online, and now here we are doing a, a joint session together. So, absolutely. Um, so for all the technical things that might be glitching right now with audio and video and sound, thanks for those of you who have stuck it out with us. Uh, we definitely want to do another one of these in the future when we have time. So if you have any follow up questions you'd like to drop in, uh, please do so in the comments down below. I'm sure we'll be in the comments kind of answering afterwards uh, as well. We'll get notifications for those. Um, and also, please take a moment to like and share the video with your other teaching friends so that they get a hold of it. Um, Matt, where can people connect with you if they want to you know, ask more questions or follow up with you? So if you go to matthewblackmedia.com slash contact, you can shoot me an email and you, on my website, you can get access to my blog where I share some articles about uh, different things. Um, my Patreon, I actually share exercises and the technique packet and exercises that we use with Carmel, as well as some soundscape, electronic sound reinforcement information, patreon.com slash Matthew Black Media, um, or just shoot me a message on Facebook. If you just search me, uh, Matthew Black on Facebook. I'm pretty good about Facebook Messenger and getting back to people. So, Awesome. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you again so much for tuning in for today's impromptu stream. Uh, we're going to leave this up so that you can catch the replays. And um, if you'd like to find out more information, please just shoot us a note on any of those social media platforms. Uh, thanks again, Matthew, for sharing your time with us today. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And I will see you in the next video. Take thanks. Care, guys. Bye.